And hello, Drew Henry. Drew's got a new tea, a tea company in Spokane and is the fastest growing tea company in the country. Hey, Tom. Hi, Shane. Glad you could join us from Carbon Quest. Hey, guys. Andy from Inherent. Andy's a Spokane kid that is leveraging technology from WSU and the University of, uh, of Utah for uh, male infertility. Hi, everyone. Just a few more minutes. <clears throat> Ray, I'm glad you could join us today. Good to see you, Tom, and good to see everyone. I, I hope you're, uh, I hope you're uh, uh, reaching out to all your contacts to get people to, to join us at uh, Sparks Weekend. I've sent some stuff out. Perfect. From my Gonzaga guys. And then we just got a, one more brief introduction here before we turn it over. I've got Sky Henderson on the call here, and Sky is with uh, Cole's company in Spokane, and, and Cole's is kind of... Uh, uh, typically been one of the uh, largest angel and early stage investors in our region and just a, a, a great partner to work with. And they've, I, I, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but uh, if there's a deal in Spokane, there's probably a 75% chance they're a backer behind it. I think that's about right. Nice to be here. Thanks, Tom. And then just one last introduction. We have Richard Dennedy on the phone and Richard uh, is uh, president and C CEO of uh, Lee and Hayes, which uh, is an IP uh, intellectual property law firm based here in Spokane and uh, universally ranked as one of the top IP firms in the country based here in Spokane. And, and Richard is also my boss, is uh, chairman of Ignite. And he's here today <laughs> to kind of do that annual evaluation of my performance. So make me look good, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that's the way that goes, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, I really appreciate everyone here uh, coming out for uh, Meet the Investor with uh, Chris DeVore. And uh, this is uh, sponsored by uh, Rick Rep and Witherspoon Kelly. And uh, before we officially get started, Rick, do you want to kind of kick us off and uh, introduce uh, Chris to the group? Sure. Thanks, Tom. Happy to. So joining us today from Seattle is Chris DeVore, a longtime startup investor uh, and also the founder and managing partner of Founders Co-op, a seed stage venture capital fund that uh, serves the Pacific Northwest. Chris is well known in the startup financing world, uh, not only for his investments and in board service with numerous startups, but also for his volunteer work with organizations like the UW Innovation Roundtable, and his articles in GeekWire. So it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Chris to join us today. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Rick, and thanks for uh, being a sponsor of this. Um, and I'm delighted to have Chris here. Uh, Chris, I, Chris and I haven't been in, 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 reason, in, in too close of contact the last several years, uh, but I've followed Chris from afar. And uh, if I were to uh, put my you know, kind of rose colored glasses on and, and think about if there's one VC in Seattle that I'd like to most uh, closely align myself with, it would probably be Chris. Um, it may be closely aligned, it's not the, the, the best word, but what he does in Seattle and how- I mean, I'm sure that there are hydroelectric that. plants on Niagara yeah. Falls somewhere. I think someone needs to mute, but- uh, um, anyway, what I was saying is, uh, uh, you know, Chris, uh, Chris uh, has, has a style that I that I would uh, uh, boldly say I'd love to be able to replicate here in Spokane. He's a very active investor in early stage companies. Um, he really rolls up his sleeve and um, and guides them. And also, he's uh, very active in the entrepreneurial community in the Seattle region and in trying to make it as best as possible. So, um, with that. Um, I'm just going to start off here when I was going to do my research for uh, uh, for today. I noticed on your LinkedIn profile, you describe yourself as a professional troublemaker. What does that mean? That's a good question. It's been that way for over a decade. I just have never bothered to change it. And I think probably like a lot of people who found themselves in the entrepreneurial community, I have just found that I don't 
I don't fit naturally in other organizations. I tend to sort of spot things that I think are, I don't know, not working the way they ought to be. And I tend to raise my hand and say, hey, what about this? So in general, anytime I want, I wind up in an organization, I tend to be the person that's, that raises my hand and says, hey, what about this? And so that's what I mean by professional troublemaker is I don't, I don't sit, I'm not good at sitting by and, and kind of letting things roll. I, I tend to make a fuss if I, if I think there's something that needs to be done. Excellent. Well, that's kind of a good uh, uh, transition into my next question is, why don't you tell us more about your background and, and some of the, the things that you've done before you started uh, Founders Co-op a number of years ago? Well, it's a long story, and I'll try not to bore you with the details too much, but I think it's useful to know that I was uh, not, I'm not technical by background, so I've been in the software business for quite a long time, but I was an American studies major with a concentration in literature undergrad. I didn't know what I wanted to do with that. Um, so I started out like a lot of folks do in management consulting. And one of our biggest clients was AT&T. And so I wound up before the internet was a thing working at AT&T as a software product manager. And that's when I sort of fell in love with software and building, building products and building teams. Um, but AT&T, I was not a good fit for that culture. It was At the time it was still 300,000 people and you know, big bureaucratic organization. So I came back to Seattle to work for the McCaw. Craig McCaw was a wireless entrepreneur for those of you who were around back in the day. And that was my first chance to work for a really entrepreneurial organization. Craig was, was a very aggressive, high growth entrepreneur, um, mostly financed through, through junk debt. This is back in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and that's when I sort of got lit up to what, how fun business could be, entrepreneurial business could be. And AT&T then bought McCall while I was there. And so mm -hmm. I was pretty sure I didn't want to stick around for that. And the, and the sort of surprising thing to, you know, to me and others is that I went to Patagonia, the clothing company after that, um, because they had a product product leadership role running six of their product lines. This And this had nothing to do with software. I was just interested in the outdoor business. I'd grown up in Seattle and kind of liked the brand and liked what they stood for. But it was 1995 and I was excited about the internet. And so I started pestering the Chenards who were the, the owners and founders of the company that they should be selling their stuff online. And if you know anything about them, they're famously sort of anti-technology and they were very skeptical of computers and the internet and all those things. And finally, after about a, a year of work in my principal job, I said, hey, tell you what, why don't you let me take a one year contract position as the head of e-commerce and I'll build you an online store. And if you don't like it, you can fire me and shut it down. But I just tried to de-risk that proposition for them as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And they said yes. And so, so I got into the, into the branded e-commerce business back in, in 96, 97. Um, I, it was clear to me at the time that I really needed to be where the internet was happening. So I applied to business school at Stanford, wound up getting mm -hmm. in, moved to um, San Francisco or the Bay Area again in, in 97. And I spent about a year in business school. And I think the best thing, I, I met my wife there. So I got, got okay. tangible That's benefit for being there. But the guys that I had hired as my external software vendor for Patagonia, because we had no native software engineering capacity, they were a bunch of UW Madison dropouts and they had bootstrapped the company up in Madison. They moved to San Francisco for the same reason I did. And I started working with them on the side because I liked them and we'd had fun working together. And after a while, I was sort of sitting in class wondering, why am I sitting here reading about other people's businesses when I could be working on a business of my own. So I wound up joining those guys as a partner. And then we built and scaled that business. Not, it wasn't huge. It was about 50 people and about 15 million run rate. And then we sold it to a public company called Sapient, now called Publicist Sapient in the late nineties. And I spent a couple of years working for Sapient and then just realized I wanted to be back in the Northwest really for personal family reasons. Moved back up here in 2001 and started a business here, um, raised money locally from Ignition Capital, if, if you know that firm, and then from um, Mobius VC or SoftBank, an arm of SoftBank. And I think the biggest realization that I had, I can tell you about that business, that business wasn't a, wasn't a, wasn't a success. And, and I can tell you a bunch of reasons why, mostly with our execution failures. But the, the bigger realization was to be a founder in Seattle or the Northwest was so much harder than it had been in the Bay Area that as a, as a community, we're really rich in talent, engineering talent in particular, but we don't have a, a, a strong, well-integrated community of high-performing founders. And that, and that if you get off on the wrong foot as a founder early, it's really hard to get, to get back on track. I mean, if you want to go the venture capital route, so many things sort of tip you out of that game early on. And it, but if you give people the right support and the right advice at the beginning and they have the right skills, you can go as far in the venture capital pathway in the Northwest as you can anywhere. So I think what I got excited about as, as a mission 
was to help the most talented technical founders in the Northwest achieve the biggest possible outcomes they could as entrepreneurs, but to do it right here in our backyard, not to have to leave town to go to San Francisco or somebody else to do the work. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, so anyway, that's that's a lo longer than I wanted it to be, but no. that's the that's the history of how I wound up doing what I did. But along the way, you also started TechStars, or you brought the TechStars franchise to to Seattle as well. Yeah, and the, and the and the story on that was the, the guy that that I had raised money from at SoftBank was a guy named Brad Feld. He left and moved to Boulder um, and started a firm called Foundry Group out there that folks may have come across. And, and Brad was the original angel investor um, in with David Cohen in, in Techstar. So they started it in Boulder. It was, a, it was a single location thing. And because I'd known Brad, I was aware of it and, and said, hey, if you ever want to move that out of just Boulder, we'd love to run that up in Seattle. So they started in 2007. They did two seasons in Boulder. They added Boston as their first expansion city. And then Seattle was um, the third and then New York was the fourth. So that, that's sort of the history on how that came to pass. So ran that for 10 okay. years and then handed off a couple of years ago on that. Got it. Um, hey, before I, before I continue, um, I wanna make this very interactive. And if you have any questions at all, please send them to me in the chat box and then I will call on you to, uh, to ask them of, uh, of Chris. Um, so your firm, your, your tagline, so to speak, is built by founders, funded by founders, designed by founders. Um, can you kind of elaborate on that and, and, and how, you, how you chose that as your distinction? Yeah, and I think, you know, I don't, I don't think it's as unique now in the world of VC as it was when we started, but the, my experience, uh, having been a founder of raising money from venture capitalists in, in the old days, was VCs were mostly not entrepreneurs. They were people who come up through a finance pathway or, or yeah. corp dev, and they were big company guys, and they were sort of suit and tie guys, and they thought it was a finance function, right? That it was that it was about about capital access. And my experience as a founder, particularly as at the early stage, and I think you know, as you climb the venture capital stack and get into later rounds, it is much more of a finance function. But at the seed or pre-seed or even Series A stage, it's really much more about about organizational development. It's it's team building and go to market and strategy and dealing with uncertainty. And and I think I wanted to be the kind of investor that I wished I had come across when I was on the other side of the table, which is somebody who you know they, they raise money and they've got a business model, but they have real empathy for and can bring content to the work of being an entrepreneur. And, and most of the VCs when we were starting out that I'd come across didn't have that lens, couldn't, couldn't, bring, couldn't approach the work in that way. Okay, and, and who else is on your team? Right, so the, the, my original co-founder and partner was a guy that I'd started a business with in the 2000s. And for, for a bunch of reasons, we just realized we weren't, we weren't a good fit for each other early on. So it, it takes a while to sort of wind, wind yeah. those things down. But he worked his way out of the business by about 2012 or 2013. Uh, we started in 2008. And then along the way, I had um, a founder in our first portfolio, a guy named Aviel Ginsberg. He'd started a company called Simply Measured, and, and I was a seed investor there. And I kept pulling him in as a diligence partner because he, he started his career as an individual contributor, software developer, and then became a CTO and then became CEO. So he, he'd worked his way up the, up the pathway, but from the technical side. And so I just kept asking him for advice about how to think about people's product and engineering orgs. We, we had a lot of fun working together and a lot of trust and thought about the world in the same ways. So as he was thinking about his next step, preparing to sell his business, we started exploring the idea of, hey, would you ever want to join and do this work? He's younger than I am. So it was sort of, you know, VC is kind of an old man's game. And I was like, well, do you want to be a founder again? Or do you want to, do you want to cross over early? And long story short, he joined as a venture partner for Fund 3, then my full partner for Fund 4, and now we're on Fund 5. So, so it's been a steady progression. I've known him since forever, since early days, but, but having him cross over to join the, join the fund was a, was a process of you know, working together and building trust and then him making a life choice about. And one thing I'll say about the fund business, you know, every fund has a 10 to 12 year life. Yep. So it's not a job that you enter or leave without consideration. It's, it's got a long tail to it. So it's so it's a it's a weighty choice to decide to become a venture investor uh, professionally, at least because you know every time you raise a new fund, you're signing up for for ten to twelve years more of that work. So it's not something you do lightly. Yep, I I, I know that movie well. Um, yeah. Um. So is there anybody else on your team, or just the two of you? Nope. Nope. There's just the two of us, and I think you know we we've got obviously uh, a bunch of you know lawyers and accountants and auditors and folks who help with the with the back yeah. office. But in terms of investment decision making, it's just the two of us. 
huh? Well, that's a very lean, efficient team for the size of the for the amount of capital you have have under management. That's sort of how we like it. We've talked about what whether whether or how we would add somebody else to it. And you know, the truth is because we had such a such a long like it's a very high commitment, high trust function. Again, it's it's hard to imagine adding somebody to the team um, that you would entrust with putting other people's money at risk because ultimately we're accountable for that for that risk. Yeah. So it's 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 a, it's an active discussion, but for the moment, it's just the two of us. Yeah, good. Well, can you can you um, kind of summarize for the for the group here? You know, what is your focus in terms of industry stage? You know, geograph geography is pretty obvious. I guess it's primarily the yep. Pacific Northwest, but you know, what, what are you really looking for in addition to uh, you know, founders who have the it factor? Right. So that, the, it's useful you, you said that because the, we called the, the fund what we did because we are founder-centric investors, by which that means we will follow really extraordinary founders into places we didn't ever expect to go. We are non-thematic by by practice, meaning we don't pre-decide what we're going to invest in and what we're not other than software. We, we only do software. So we don't do device. We don't do bio, biology. You know, we don't, we don't do pharma. We don't do those. Like we understand software, particularly enterprise software, but we will engage with software founders that are doing almost anything to see if it's something that we can get excited about, about doing. Now I say that in practice, the joke we tell on ourselves is every time we've ever done something in consumer, they wind up pivoting to the enterprise. And every time we've done something in the enterprise that's not about the revenue cycle, which is about how, to, how do you grow a business, they wind up pivoting to the revenue cycle. So that's, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But truth of the matter is we really understand those kinds of business problems and those kind of founders best. And we've done stuff that sits outside that frame. Um, but we tend to sit kind of, if you think about where, you know, the enterprise business problem, either developer facing tooling, how, how do I make an engineering team more productive? Business process automation, how to, how to make a business, you know, more, more productive. Mm -hmm. Financial flows, which is how do, how do they digitize financial flows or create legibility or transparency around financial flows. And a lot of people, that makes their eyes roll back in their head. Like a lot of people are more drawn to shiny consumer branded stuff. We found that we're not as good at that and, and we, when we like it less well. So it, you could say that we just do, we do boring business process stuff because it's what mm -hmm. we like and understand. But we'll look at anything. But usually we wind up back in that in that corner. Yep. And then your 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 very early stage, you know, pre-seed or seed. Yeah. And and I'll talk about that. So so the you know what they say in the venture business is your fund size is your strategy, right? Which is you know you your job as a fund manager is is to build a. <laughs> sorry, I've got a dog in the background. Um, <laughs> is to build a portfolio, like it, it, if you weren't going to manage people's risk, they'd invest directly, right? So you need to build a basket of, of investments that helps, helps, you know, create upside, but limit, limit the downside risk. So it needs to be big enough, but it needs to be concentrated enough for when things work, you own enough of them to return the fund many times over. That's, that's the job. Yeah. So if, a, if we have a $50 million fund, we think we need to get to 20 to 25 names, meaning 20 to 25 opportunities in that fund. Uh -huh. We won't invest more than 10% of the fund in any one deal. And so normatively we wind up investing somewhere between a million to 2 million on a first check basis into a company where we can own, you know, median about 10%, 10% or more is what we're shooting for. So, so the, what we do falls out of the fund size and, and the risk management strategy of a fund like that. Yeah. Investing in small checks, our time, our time needs to go kind of in lockstep with how our money goes writing small checks in other people's rounds, we don't own enough and we don't, and it's not worth our time, but writing really big check, like trying to compete at the series A fund, we don't have the capital to, to play there. Yeah. So you'll wind up participating in rounds that are probably in the five to $20 million post money value, you know, yeah. uh, and you try to own as much as you can without being a jerk and without screwing up the next fundraise. Yep. Yep. Um, makes sense. How do you, how do you, how do you define I'm sure it's a gray area, but how do you define the distinction between pre-seed and seed? I mean, it's, it's murky. I would say that we, uh, by observation, are willing to invest earlier than most folks yep. around. And part of that is, you know, having, having done this for a long time and have invested in a lot of companies and also running the Techstars program, Techstars in particular, you know, we, we had probably 150 companies that passed through that system between the various flavors that we ran. And so you, you get, you, you just get a lot of road time with founders that are very, very early in their journey. 
and you can see their, their thought process and how they get to conviction around what they're gonna do and how they scale it. So I think our kind of mental pattern database of how you get to success when you don't have a, a fully realized team or a lot of money or even a product is we just have a richer set of examples to draw on there. So mm -hmm. to me, that's pre-seed, which is you're really betting on a team. They probably don't have a product in market. They're not generating any money. You don't have any customers or revenue. So it's not data-based investing. And a lot of people, they kind of want, they want, you know, a track record of shipping product or of selling stuff or revenue growth. Yeah. We're totally happy to invest on, on the people if we believe in them and believe in, the, in what they're doing. And that would, that's what I would call pre-seed investing. Seed investing is probably more, I've got a team together. I've got a V1 of the product. I'm out there trying to sell it. It's, it's not working yet. It's not scaling yet, you know, yeah. but, but, we're, but we're in the fight and we've decided, we've made the hard decisions about who we are and what we're going to do. And then I would say series A investing is the first scale up round now, which yeah. is, it, which is, okay, you figured out how to go to market. You figured out what your, what your kind of, your solution is. Let's at, let's dump money on scaling your engineering team, your go to market team, your marketing team. That's how I think about the kind of, so, but you know, but what you pay for those deals or what, what they're, what, what's a fair value for those is all over the map, but that's, it's really about where are you on the journey? Yep. Yep. Good definitions. Now you talk about uh, your funds and, and, re, and returning investors capital um, in, in multiples of the fund, but you also say somewhere on your website that uh, building great companies in the place you live produces returns that go way beyond a check in the mail. Well, what, what are some of those ancillary benefits? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, we all live our lives as humans in a place, right? So our, our work may be digital and we may have customers around the world, but when we, when we step away from our laptop, we go out in the world and we interact with people or we send our kids to school or we go to a park. And, and we feel like if you don't pay attention to the whole of your role as an investor or as a citizen or as a founder, you're not really doing your job. And so one of the reasons why we think about place-based investing is we, we think that if we are contributing to making the Northwest or Seattle or wherever you Spokane, a better place, meaning a better place for people to live or raise their families or to move if they're thinking about a, a, a relocation, that makes us stronger in the long run. There's more, more talent, there's more opportunity, there's more diversity, there's all those good things. Yeah. So you know, we have to do our job as investors and make money for our LPs or we don't get to keep playing. Like that's the reality. Yeah, but we take seriously the the responsibility to be positive contributors to our community and our society uh, along the way. So okay. simple as that. And you, your office, for example, is in on the UW campus, isn't it? It is, and there that was a little bit of a kind of a quirk quirk of, of fate. I I spent a bunch of time around the UW trying to work yep. around you know their innovation ecosystem, and then when we were running TechStars, we really needed a place uh, every year to bring. 10 teams, so call it, you know, 30 to 50 people into a space for 12, 12 weeks at a time. So it was sort of a weird space requirement. And, and when I was spending time with the U, it was actually the guy who ran their real estate, because, you know, the U owns a bunch of land and buildings around the city of Seattle because they've been around for a long time. The guy who ran the real estate portfolio said, hey, would you ever consider officing on the UW campus? And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And basically the, the old law school, the, the, the U, Bill and Melinda Gates had paid to build a new law school on the main campus. The old law school building is this really um, something beautiful, something ugly, brutalist concrete structure, about six story structure, kind of on the fringe of campus. Yeah. And that was, it was essentially a surplus building. They were using some classrooms on the ground floor and they, they, had, they were using some of the you know, surge space for construction. But the whole second floor, which had been the library and reading room, really dramatic, fun space was vacant. And, and this guy had this sort of creative idea, like, would you ever want to put, put what you do on campus as a way to bring more commercial energy to campus, but also because we've got this sort of surplus space sitting around. And that was how we wound up creating this thing called Startup Hall, which is where my office is and yep. was on a UDO campus. Yep, well, 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 great place to have an office. Um, it, it, it has been, I mean, and I live nearby, so you know, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all the good. It's all, it's all <laughs> Perfect. So if you, if you um, identify a team of founders that you like, and they're in software. What are some of the other things you're looking for in terms of, I don't know, business model, competitive environment, uh, distribution channels? Uh, yeah. what, are, what are some of the other criteria that you, if the first two boxes are checked, what else are you looking for? Yeah, I mean, the hardest part, I think, for most people to really understand is the realities of venture math. And what I, might, what I mean by that is, 
So I'll go back to the kind of the fun, fun size stuff. Let's say, so $50 million fund, uh, you want every investment you make out of that fund to be potentially fund returning, right? So if we got to, we got to at least get 50 million back and we're going to deploy, you know, somewhere between two and five in that opportunity. And let's say we own 10% at the beginning and we're down to 5% after a bunch of rounds of dilution. Mm -hmm. So for us, for our 5% position to get, generate 50 million bucks, the outcome has to be a billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we don't believe that any one company can produce a billion dollar outcome to, to the fund where, where we can return the fund on it, we can't, as much as we like the people and think they're great and think what they're doing is cool, we can't spend time on it mm -hmm. because we're not doing our job as investors. If, if, and I think that's the most frustrating thing for most entrepreneurs. We're like, well, you guys are investors and you have money and we need money. And so why don't you write us a check? It's like, well, your, your opportunity is just not big enough. Um, and that's a judgment call. Sometimes we're wrong about that, but we've been doing this a while and we have opinions about it. So if we can't get to conviction that what you're doing is going to put us in a position to do our job as investors, we say no. Um, and that, that I think is the thing that's sort of most confusing to, because there's lots of really good entrepreneurs with good ideas and good products, but they're ultimately going to max out in terms of their, their opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and Again, we're not always right about that, but um, yeah. that and 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 there's there's all kinds of ways to make money in the world, right? right? right. But that that ultimately is the thing that we we say no almost almost you know nine times out of ten that's the reason why we just don't yeah. think we're going to get there. Okay, so you you look at every opportunity that as a minimum at the time that you invest you believe will return the fund. I mean, I think that's that's the yeah. only way to do the work. Yeah. It's funny, I, I guess in all the times I've been doing this, I never really thought of it that way, but um, I, I, may, I may have been thinking about it that way, but I never really thought about it so specifically that way, but right. it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, so what, one thing too, when you're kind of uh, evaluating new opportunities, your partner, Ali, on your website says, don't pitch me your product. What, what, what does he mean by that? So I, I think, um, and it's a good post for those who are curious. It's, it, they're, they're, it's up there on the, on the, on the website. So we, we work with engineers a lot, right? People who can build their own products. We tend to work with technical founders and they tend to fall in love with the thing they're building. And the reality is that building value as an entrepreneur is about solving customer problems. And I think you need to hold pretty lightly your attachment to the what and much more be focused on the, on the process of engaging with customers and listening to them and trying stuff and solving their problems. And so when we engage with founders who are um, really focused on the what and, and, and want to tell us all about the features of the engineering, we, we tend to at least throw a flag and be like, well, how do you think about, like, like how do you get this thing to market? How do you engage with customers? What, what's, what's missing from this solution that you might need to add over time? So, so to me, it's a little bit of, of a shorthand for the blind spot that we often encounter with technical founders who, who've never built a company before. Yep, um, I really liked it. Um, and, and, and I would encourage everybody to, to look at the Founders Co-op website after the call, because um, it's really chock full of kernels of wisdom. And, um, you know, to the, to the product point, I mean, I think you say that you're, you're, you're investing in these companies to see if they're smart enough to go out and figure out to answer the questions that they don't know right now. How, how, how can the, I think even Ali is so direct to say, usually at the time we look at them, the product is wrong. It's bad. It doesn't work. And we're okay with that as long as they, we believe they can ultimately figure it out with the funds that we provide them. That's right. Yeah, no, a business is just a machine for solving customer problems for money. And if you forget that, you know, and get caught up in, in, in you know, pl playing startup, I think you often, you often don't get where you wanted to go. Yep, good. We're about halfway through it. I just want to remind people, if you have questions, you know, feel free to uh, send them to me in the chat box. We have got a couple of queued up now that I'm going to get to toward the end of our, our discussion here. But if you have others, please send them. Now, one thing you also say is that uh, you guys are first and fast. Um, I think we probably have the first part covered because you're, you're pre-seed and seed, but tell me about being fast. What does that mean? Yeah. So, and um, one of the things that we've, well, I'll, I'll, I'll back up, which is I'll, I'll just, the, the facts are, if we like somebody, we can usually get to an investment decision within a week. 
Uh, and that, and the way we often do it is one of us will spend time with the founder and say, this is pretty interesting. I, you should, you should see him too. And we hand them off. And then, and we try to do that separately because we each come at it from different, different angles. Yeah. If we both have met with somebody and we both like it and think it's pretty interesting, we pretty quickly shift to, you know, are we going to do something here? And if we are, let's, let's talk about it. Um, because founders time is super precious and, and stringing them along, wasting their time or asking for stuff. And, and so if, if we can get, we both like it, the founder wants to work with us, we can get the terms. You can pretty quickly get to, we think we should do something here. Yeah. And then there, there are obviously steps like we got to talk to your co-founder or we'd love to talk to a you know, customer if you've got one. Like there are things that you, you can do to triangulate around them. Yeah. But one of the things that we, that we find frustrating with a lot of early stage investors, and I, I mentioned before, there, there's just not like the whole idea of due diligence at the pre-seed <laughs> stage. There's not that much to diligence, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Are, are you incorporated? Do you have yeah. a criminal record? Like it's pretty basic. Yeah. And the nice thing about investing in this geography is because we've been at it for a long time. It's very rare that we can't, even if we've never met somebody before, that we can't get surround sound on them through our network. Someone who's worked with them yeah. before, someone who's went to school with them. Like we can do that really fast. Yeah. Um, and so, so there's sort of no reason to pretend that we're doing quote unquote due diligence if we, if we can get to conviction on them and what they're doing and we, and we get to terms that we like. Right. And, it, and most of the time we also would like, we want to get to know fast because that saves them and us time, which is, you know what, this is, we're not getting anywhere. We're not going to ask you, we're not going to string you along and make you think we're going to get to an investment if we're pretty clear we're not. We're just going to pass and move on because that's better for all of us. And with just the two of you, scheduling partners meetings to take a vote on an investment is probably pretty easy. We, I, I, we, are, we are in chat all the time, every day. And so we're, there, there's there very little slippage between what we're thinking and, and what we're talking to each other about. Yep. And, and early stage investing is way more of an art than a science. So, um, um, you know, what you say about the due diligence being pretty efficient, uh, you know, holds very true from my perspective as well. Yeah. No, and, and I think one of the things that I'll say is, is um, I, I appreciate the mission of a bunch of the kind of angel networks around the Northwest that are really training people in what does it mean to be an investor. And I think, and I think there, there's good training out there, but, but I will say that in general, those angel networks that do do pre-seed investing, they do their membership a disservice by marching the membership through what I call diligence theater yeah. to, to serve the training mission, and, and, but, but at the same time doing a real disservice to their relationship with founders. So. Yep. And the, the other benefit of having kind of just the two of you is, I don't know, some automobile industry expert once said, you don't want to design a car by committee. And if you've got, you know, uh, a bunch of kind of smart VCs all looking at a company, you know, you, you, your, your, um, your decision making might migrate to the mean and, and you'll, 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 you'll miss some of the more interesting out of the box ideas. Well, and the accountability is really clear too, which is if, if you get it wrong, there's sort of no one, no one else to blame. Like we, we own, we own our, our successes and we own our failures with, with a lot of accountability. Yep. So when, when it comes to a deal, are you guys typically leading? Are you, you co-leads? Uh, do you have a preference? Are you indifferent? What, what's what's yeah. your views on that? So, I mean, back, back to the ownership goals. So normatively, you know, a, a, a private financing round is going to probably dilute the founder somewhere between 20 to 30 yep. percent you know if if we don't own 10 percent of a business we probably like we'll do it sometimes because whatever it's all we could get and we think it's amazing but we need to own that much for the funds math to work which means we're almost always the biggest uh first check or or, yep. or we're co-leading with somebody else but that's just and that's just the math of, of what we need to do as a fund um we also i mean we're often faster so we're, we're sort of first to put terms down in many yeah. cases um but we don't we don't have religion about it if if we're, we're we have a small amount of money and some things that have done spectacularly well for us so we'll we'll, we'll we can break our rules anytime we want yeah. but most of the time we're we're the biggest check we're going first and we're writing the terms okay good and then what kind of describe your involvement uh post investment yeah, so I mean, we're we're really good at zero to one, which is is this a thing, and how do you get the team around it? We're not great growth investors, right? It's just no, we're not what we're we don't yeah. love it. It's not our discipline. Yeah. So I, I am still on the board of a you know Series C company. Um, like we stay involved in some cases where we need to, but usually we're recycling our time 
kind of up up to Series A, and then we're sort of start to realize we're we're not really adding value, and we go back to the beginning. So very mm -hmm. involved from from the first round through Series A, and yeah. whether we're on the board or not, we're spending time with the founders every couple of weeks. We're talking to them about hiring. We're talking to them about business decisions. We're we're a sounding board um, and a and a source of customer leads. Or we do a lot of fundraising support. So mm -hmm. anytime you're raising money, if we're on your cap table, we're making intros or giving you feedback on your pitch or you know, all, all kinds of work around making sure you get the next, because that's how we de-risk ourselves and get the capital behind these things to grow them. Yeah. Um, it, it very, I mean, it's across the board. Some, some founders, you know, want more and, and some want less and some have more good investors around the table and some were the only ones in the room. So I don't, I don't think there's a normative one, but we, we try to do anything we can to help people succeed as for as long as they want us to, but after series A or B, we're, we're not the best guys at that. Okay. I actually kind of have one question off script here, you know, with, with two, with two partners and you guys um, across your funds have invested in over 200 companies and you're helping all these, how do you balance work life sort of situations? I mean, yeah, that's, that's it's a, a good question. Like 200 kids. Yeah. So, I mean, yes and no, meaning, you know, not all of them are still like, we probably have 50 active portfolio companies yeah. right now, which sounds like a lot, but a bunch of them are, are you know, they don't, they don't, need us they're they're yeah. all grown up right so it's it's probably the the you know 20 or so companies that are still in the early innings that we spend the most time on okay and and if you like the funny thing about being an investor is you know we don't we don't have our own team to manage we don't have any direct reports we're not doing one-on-ones we're not doing performance reviews we're not doing budgeting like all the things yeah. that you do when you're managing a bunch of people we don't do those things we're investors we're minority investors we're giving advice but none of the things that we're doing take that much time. It's really just a matter of being, being quick, like being, being available yeah. when they want you. And, and like, so I've got founders that are texting me all the time and I do calls yeah. on the weekend. Like I'm always available, Yeah. but it, but it's not like we're spending other than board meetings, which are the most time consuming thing that we do. And the and board meetings suck up a lot of our calendar. It's really just a light touch of being available when they need you and doing yeah. your work and activating your network. But it's not like, I don't, uh, let's just put it this way. I love what I do because I have yep. a lot of autonomy about where my time goes. Yeah. It all, it all fits. It yeah. all fits. Yep. Got it. Um, also one of the things you can say on your website is that, uh, you identify the traps and the pitfalls that derail companies before they even get started. Can you, do you have any kind of anecdotal stories or commentary on that? Yeah. Well, and I think the, the, the easiest thing to say is the things that most companies fail on in the beginning are not competitors. Like they're, they're not the things that people worry about. It's usually founder conflict, mm -hmm. misalignment of founder incentives or, or behaviors or communication. Um, and then it's, and then the next big one that trips people up is failure to, to anticipate scale. Right, which is the founders try to take on too much. They get stretched too thin. Balls start to get dropped. Customers start to notice. But but if you can get people to recognize those patterns at the beginning of, are we on the same page and are we communicating with with high high trust and fidelity about what we're doing here? That's mm -hmm. the biggest first block. And then when things start to work, can you help people actually? And, and I'll, I'll be, the sort of pieces of this are, can you get them to hire the roles that they need to hire for? Yeah. Can you get them to hire people that are better than they are? Because a lot of people, if they're young, are, are intimidated by hiring people that are really good at what they do. But that's how you get leverage as a founder. Mm -hmm. it, those, those two buckets are the things that would cause probably 80 percent of the failure in between zero and series A. And yeah. we do that all the time, all day long. And we've seen every flavor of that. Um, and we, and we're, we're not shy about pointing it out when we see it. So it's not. Um, I would say it's not a complicated problem. Every, every company is different. Every human is, is different, but the patterns are really, really repeatable. And yeah. the interventions are usually really repeatable if we've chosen correctly, meaning if the founders are open to our feedback, if right. they're not open to our feedback, we show, we made a bad choice. We should not have invested in those founders. Yep. Yep. What about the myth of overnight success? Oh yeah. I can go on and on about that one. So, uh, I, That's I had I as an investor, my first seed, seed, you know, lead seed investment to IPO was last November. It was a check I wrote in 2011. Um, so 11 years from, yeah. from first check to outcome. Was that Remitly? Got, that was Remitly. Yeah. Okay. 
I got a couple others that, that look like that. Outreach is one where I led the seed round also 2011 and they're still private, but you know, the yeah. last you know, big, big valuation, like it is hard work building a business of, of meaningful yeah. scale, yeah. right? It's easy to start uh, and hard, hard to finish or hard to finish well. And what I like about that as an investor is, you know, it's sort of like you, you stack up all of these companies and you, and you work with them as you go. And some of them make it a certain distance and some of them go all the way. But if I just keep persisting, the good companies just get stronger and stronger and stronger. Yep. And I get to keep opening up new, new kind of opportunities with founders as, as I go. So when you look back at it, there's a, just an awful lot of great companies and great leaders and great organizations but day to day, it's just it's just you know working with working with teams uh, mm -hmm. and and trying to find new stuff. So I I I love what I get to do, but if you expect to do it for the money, forget it. Yeah. Right? It just takes yeah. an awful long time for the money to show up. If you love the work, it's the best work going. Right. If if you love what you do, it's not a job, right? Yeah, and I, and that's a cliche, but I I tell you, for for me, I don't know. You know, my wife makes fun of me because you know there's the cocktail party question of like, well, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? Yep. And I don't have an answer to that question. And, that, and, and she's like, that, that's annoying, right? You, you, got, yeah. you, got, you should have like the, the road not taken. Right. Um, I don't know what else I'd do with myself if I weren't doing this. Yeah, uh, well, I, uh, I, I mirror that image. Um, so what, what, another question. So of, of, of your companies that you backed and they have gone through a successful exit or an IPO, what percent of those companies were still led by the founding CEO at the time of the exit? Yeah, that's a good question. We, so we as investors, as I you know, mentioned the, why we called it what we did, we have a strong founder bias, um, meaning that we don't think anybody cares as much, obsesses as much about the business, will we'll do whatever it takes to make the business successful. Yep. Once you transition to a, to a, a hired professional manager, yeah kind of no matter how much stock you give them, they're always an employee, right? Like they took a job and they want, they want the job to work, but they don't have the same skin in the game. Yep. So in our portfolio, it is very rare for us to um, support or get excited about replacing the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and again, not, not that that hasn't happened. I'm trying to think of an, of an example. In some cases, somebody began as the CEO and, and self-identified that that was not the right answer. And so they, they, they transitioned to a CTO role, chief product officer role, and, and brought somebody else in to take that kind of top, top spot. But in all of, the, all of our best, most valuable companies, the original founder CEO is still the CEO. Okay. And if I look at the companies I admire the most, uh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, Amazon's an easy one because it's right in our yeah. backyard. Like up until last year, like I think, I think Jeff Bezos has a bunch of quirks as a human being that may yeah. make him not that fun to be around. But I have never seen a more effective builder of right. organizations at, at scale than him. Uh, yeah. And, you know, whether it's, you know, Benioff or Salesforce or, I mean, you know, it's. Bill Knight, Zuckerberg, Howard uh, Schultz. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know. right. Yeah, they're complicated people, and they and they're not always, you know, they're not always people you'd want your, you know, your your daughter to be dating. But but they're extraordinary <laughs> people at what they do, right? Yeah. Have you have you watched um, Super Pumped or We Crashed, which follows Uber and WeWork at all? I, I have, and I'm aware of both of them. Um, Truth of the matter is, I don't consume a lot of a lot of like I never watched Silicon Valley, the TV show, for yeah. whatever reason. It just it did. It, I wasn't drawn to it. I, like Travis is is a good example of somebody who sh who should have been replaced. I think he yeah. he was he was successful, but he was building apparently a very like toxic, yeah. damaging work environment, from what I can tell. Yeah. Um. And and I think Adam Newman similarly. There's reasons why yeah. those they they aren't running those companies. Anymore. Right. Good reasons. They, they were. They're. I mean. I typically don't watch those shows either, but I'm fascinated by both of these. And there's one great scene in uh, We Crashed shortly after SoftBank put 4.4 billion in there. And Adam Newman was already just kind of a crazy fire breathing entrepreneur. And he has a meeting with Mayusha's son or whatever his name is. And he, and he tells him, Adam, you're not crazy enough. And, and that just lights a fire on Adam to go back to his team who are otherwise trying to tone him down to even right. be crazier. Yeah. 
No, I mean, well, you know, we, we do our work in a certain way and I'm not sure it's, it's there's certainly not the only way, but it matters to us a lot about the values of the people that are running the organizations. Yeah. And we want them, we would like to work with people who are positive actors in the world, not just making, making money for us as investors, yeah. but they're trying to build organizations where they care about people and care about their communities. Right. And there's certain people that, that we've not chosen to work with that have built valuable companies, but we're not sad we didn't invest. Yep, yep. So just kind of a, from a structural standpoint, um, do you have any particular preferences between you know preferred stock, safes, convertible notes? I mean, there's there's so many different flavors out there these days. Yeah, I mean, I think we we, we always want to wind up in the preferred um, by the Series A. Yeah, we're pretty flexible about how we get there. Um, so we we write safes all the time. We like the YC post money safe and uh -huh. use that all the time. We do usually ask for the pro rata side letter because pro rata rights matter to us as well. So it's yeah. like you learn certain things over, over time and being in the preference stack matters and having pro rata rights matter. But beyond that, what paper we use at the preceding and seed stage doesn't matter because if we're right, we're going to wind up in the preferred at the A or beyond. Yep. Yep. So roughly 25% of the deals that you invest in are companies that you've already backed. Well, what's the best way for uh, kind of a new company that uh, you haven't had involved with, involvement with previously to reach out to you or get in touch with you? Yeah, so we, we actually have a bunch of questions on our website and, okay. and an email address. And, and I actually look at every single one of those uh, myself because we don't have anybody else to do it. Yep. So yep. You, you will get in my inbox if you answer those questions and, and send them to me. I'll write back. Most of the time I'll write, write back saying, we aren't going to do this and here's why, because that's the nature of the business. But we, we have made investments uh, that, that walked in the door that way. Uh -huh. um, we also like referrals. So if, if you know somebody who's been a, been a uh, founder in our portfolio and want to ask them for an intro, that works great too. But we don't, you don't have to have an intro. You, you're welcome to walk in the front door and, and we'll uh -huh. take it seriously and let you know what we think. Okay. Um, what, are, what have been some of the more, you know, you, you backed a number of companies that have become unicorns. Can you kind of highlight, you know, uh, some of the more, you know, you know, I, I know in my history, there's some companies that I really like that um, may have been great businesses. They may not have been the best returning portfolio, but they're ones that were kind of special to me. Um, can you kind of highlight a couple of the companies that, you know, that you're particularly proud of, whether or not they were the best return on investment or not, assuming that they, they were good, but maybe not the, the best? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk about two, two, two that we've already talked about. So Remitly is one where I just think the mission of the founders, which is really about helping immigrants, you know, basically be treated more fairly by the financial system. That was their that was their impulse at the very beginning, and there are lots of twists and turns in what the product was and how they went to market. But their the the fundamental rightness of what they wanted to do has been a through line for that business from the beginning, and it's just exciting to start with somebody when it's you know two guys and, and a dog an idea to have them build a global business that that I think is going to continue to make you know huge positive impacts for for immigrants around the world. So that that one is one that's it's easy to feel good about because the people yeah. are great people and the mission's great and it's a great business. Another one that's really fun for different reasons is is outreach where you know I wrote a check to two engineers that had a failed YC startup and had some ideas in Seattle and they didn't know what they wanted to do. And then we had a company that came into Techstars that lost their CTO and they didn't know what they were going to do. And I introduced the four of them together and said, you guys, like, I got two great engineers who don't have a mission. And I got two business guys that, that just lost their CTO. You all should get together and see if there's something to do together. They became a team. That team turned into outreach, but only through several years of time in the wilderness and twists and turns. Uh -huh. And they were one of the most kind of cohesive, uh, high trust, uh, high bandwidth learning machines. Like, and four people is a, is a, is a lot of people to keep together on a, on a startup journey. So at this point, two of the founders have, have left the company um, and have started something else that we've also invested in. So we invested them a second time. Yeah. But they, they carried that ball a long way, the four of them, through lots of hardship and twists and turns. And it's now a tr it's turned into, I think, a really great business that, that's got a, a bright future ahead of it. But when I think about the, the resilience and learning capacity and, and trust um, and communication through hardship that that team went through at the beginning, they're an archetype for me of what it takes to build a, a big company. It's not just writing 
great software. It's, it's all of the human skills required to keep people on the boat when things are hard and not give up and be creative and find a way forward. So those are two very different examples okay. of, of that and I come back to. Matt Oppenheimer from Remitly has some ties to Spokane, I believe. So his co-founder, Josh Hug, went to Josh, Whistler. that's right, Josh, Josh. Yep, yep. So in fact, I think for a while, one of Josh's secret recruiting weapons, because not that many people had heard of Whitworth and they have a great CS program, is he, yeah. was, he was actively stripping engineers out of, out of Whitworth. I, maybe he's probably still doing it, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he, he does. And I think that's, that's, that's been a fun, uh, fun connection. Yeah. Well, speaking of Spokane, have you, have you evaluated or invested in the opportunities uh, in the other east side? So interesting that you mentioned, we have a, an unannounced investment in where the CEO is based in Spokane. And the question is, can I talk about it? Well, we I think I'm in that, that one with you. Oh yeah, so we, I, we, I, they haven't done any any PR on it, so I don't right, want to spill right. beans on on that. But um, you know, that was that was a founder who reached out cold, and he yeah. had noticed that we'd done some stuff that was in a similar vein, and so he just wanted to. He, he thought we knew something about the category, and we, and we were the you know the, the definitely the tail and not the dog of that fundraise, but yeah. we re, and yeah. it was expensive as you as you know. Yeah. But we really liked him, and we liked the problem he was solving, yeah. and we liked that he was in Spokane, and so we wrote him a check. Okay. I think we're talking wish, about the same company. I, I wish we could say more. Maybe we are, maybe we're not, but I can't. We, we, I can't. we, can, compare, we can compare notes later. Yeah, um, good. Yeah. Well, we'll speak it up, you know. Uh, um, you know, what, what, what observations might you have to those of us in this region about the region? I mean, um, you know, from your standpoint, um, do you see negatives or advantages to companies that might be, or founders that might be starting a company in a place like Spokane versus a, a Seattle or a Bay Area or you know somewhere yeah. else that might be more of a you know traditional tech hub? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think the the great gift that COVID has given all of us is people have really rethought the role of geography in company formation and growth. Um, and that doesn't get us all the way out of the hole, but I think it's become much clearer to investors or certain investors that people can be almost anywhere and build a company of real value. Yep. And the hardest part is probably the, the mindset of those people, which is, do they think of themselves as playing on a national or global stage and having to perform at that level? Or, or do they think that they get a you know, special dispensation for being in a smaller town or anything else? So it's like, as long as you bring your A game, I think you can be almost anywhere now and, and yeah. find a way in. Um, now, getting access to the capital system is still hard, right? Which is there's still some skepticism that if you're not in San Francisco or in New York or in LA, that you're not really serious. So the, the burden of proof is on the founder more to be like, yes, I'm based in Spokane or Seattle or whatever, but I've got a really great idea and a great team and we're going to win. And we're not just going to win in the Northwest. Yeah. You know, we're not, it's, we're not, we're not, you know, I'm not striving to be the, the win the geek wire awards. I, I want to win at whatever I'm setting out to do and I'm going to do it from here. And that gives me advantages that other people don't have. Yeah. So you, you, but you've, I, I think that that's a, sort of all I need to say on it. Like you, you can do it. It's harder yeah. for, because of access and, and you got to overcome the, the credibility gap, but you yeah. absolutely can do it. And it's easier now than it never has been. Yeah. I mean, this whole kind of, um, you know, remote embracing remote work has really helped Spokane. The amount of talent that is moving into this city because people can live wherever they want um, is something like I haven't seen in the 25 years since I've been back here, you know, including the CEO of the company that I think that we are co-investors yep, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and I don't think the genie goes back in the bottle on that. I, I think nope. it, I, it feels like re the remote first mindset is something that that's workers have come to expect it and workers talented workers have a lot of power these days and i and i think it's something you have to deal with as a founder yeah we have a couple of questions kind of on that topic uh, rip rep did you have a question yes chris this has been great thank you so much for sharing your insights uh a few years ago you wrote an article that appeared in geekwire cautioning seattle that it was at risk of becoming more like san francisco in in negative ways and i'm wondering if some of those fears have come true with regard to you know uh, creating an environment that that is affordable and works for the for innovators and you know and based upon the lessons of hindsight of what ha appears to be happening in Seattle you know what words of caution would you give to a place like Spokane that's starting to get some of that growth 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think absolutely like the, the big, I mean, one of the big problems that we're all dealing with who live in cities is, is homelessness. And there's lots of reasons for that, but the root cause of a lot of it is not being willing to grow your housing stock. So it's, it's really a land use question, which is if you allow single family zoning to dominate your, um, your zoning regime and you don't allow the housing stock to grow with pop along with population growth, housing costs are gonna go up and that's gonna push the, those who can least afford to be in the city either out of the housing system or out of the city. So I think, I think Seattle has done a better job. Like San Francisco is, is egregiously the worst of, of all major cities on, on um, NIMBYism and, and zoning. Seattle is not as bad as that, but it's not as good as it needs to be. And we're, and we're reaping the, the, the implications of that, which is housing costs have gone up much more rapidly. It's hard to afford a place to live here. And that tends to, to impact the people at the bottom of the income scale the most. So if there's one thing that you could do as a city in Spokane to address the growth that you're experiencing, which has been great and exciting, is make sure that, you are, that you're pro-housing and that your zoning policies allow the housing stock to grow at least at pace with, and, and a lot of existing homeowners or rental property owners don't want that because they like the pricing power that comes with it. So it's a hard political fight, very powerful entrenched interests don't want zoning to be loosened up um, because they're, they're gonna reap the gains. So that's the number one fight, civic fight that you have to fight is, is allowing the housing stock to grow. Beyond that, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of issues around how do you deal with homeless populations and substance abuse and all the rest of it. I think we all just, we just have to figure that, that stuff out. But if you don't, if you don't attack it at the root, which is which is the cost of housing, you're going to wind up in the same boat as everybody else. Good point. Thanks, Graham Moorhead. Did you have a question? Yeah, Chris. Thanks for coming today. Um, you answered part of my question, but I'm also interested in startups that already exist and may have started somewhere else. How can we attract them to Spokane? My thesis is around the fact that Spokane is in Washington State, where there's no income tax. And we have a number of universities here. Life cost of living is much cheaper than Seattle. But I also have a secondary question. I've heard from a friend of mine who's a founder. She founded her company entirely here without it being a Delaware corporation, saying that all the benefits tax-wise of being a Delaware corporation can be found by being a Washington State corporation. What have you heard? So... Uh... A couple. There's a bunch of questions in there. Let's start with the one, which is the the best way to attract people to your city is what you're already doing, which is making it a, a, an attractive place to live with great schools and great parks and safe streets and all like that. This is it's it's pretty simple, right? Like make it a great place to live and people will come. In terms of you know incorporation, um, I know that most investors. So if you're planning to raise money from the venture capital machine or from from investors who invest in lots of jurisdictions those investors prefer Delaware. Like if you're not a Delaware C, they're going to want you to be a Delaware C. So right, you can be, you know, you can argue with that all you want, but, but rather than like what you want the conversation in any fundraising to be about is the merits of the business and the opportunity, not about the legal niceties. So anytime you throw up a roadblock, that's not about the fundamental qualities of the business, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I would say if you plan to raise venture capital, just be a Delaware C and fight about other stuff. Okay. And one last question, uh, Jeremy Jones, do you have a question? I do, yeah, thank you um, again for your time. Um, so, so I'm wondering, I'm not sure exactly how you go about sourcing your deals, but when a founder comes to you or you, or you go to a founder, I mean, you're thinking about investing um, in their startup, what percentage of the time is that a first time founder and how vital um, or, or what importance does that play if this is their first rodeo or, or what their past is? Because investing in the, the pre seed stage, I've heard a lot, of, and you said it yourself, you're essentially investing in the founders. Um, so I, I know that the idea plays a role as well, but, but what, what percentage of the time are, is this someone's first rodeo? Yeah, so we, we mostly work with first-time founders, and I would say most of the second-time founders we work with are just people that we backed previously ourselves. So they, they, they come back to us for the, for the second time around. Um, and, be, and the reason why is a lot of founders are people who've come up through the, through the engineering pathway in an organization. They got hired at a big company like Amazon and Microsoft and they learned a bunch of valuable stuff. And then they got frustrated with something. 
right? They, they didn't like the way, you know, that a certain thing was done on their engineering team where they didn't like the way a certain customer problem was solved. And they, and they sort of get obsessed with that problem. And they're like, I, I think there's a better way to do it, but I can't do it in the context of my big company. I'm going to go on and do it myself. That, that is often the pathway to the founding kind of insight that the folks we work with have. Um, the problem, as we talked about a little bit earlier with first time founders is because they've never done it before, they, they don't have the same pattern recognition that, that we have or that another more experienced founder has with all the things that are not about engineering and product that go wrong in a company. And we talked about some of those earlier, which is how do you communicate with your co-founders? How do you, how do you think about solving customer problems? How do you interact with customers? How do you raise money? How do you deal with investors? So one of the things that we like to do as investors is help first-time founders see around corners a little bit for the problems that they're going to encounter they've never seen before. Um, and that's one of the services that we provide, not that we charge for it. It's just something that we do along with our money is, is help people avoid the obvious mistakes that, that can trip them up and let them focus on the really hard problems in the business that they need to figure out to, to be successful. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. For sure, yeah. So essentially what, what it sounds like you're saying is these engineers typically have um, more of the, the product and the idea, but, but they've never started a business. So then they don't really have the, the, the technical business mind behind it. And that's where you come into play. Yeah, or I guess what I would say is 80% of building a business is the same no matter what kind of business you're building. It's, okay. it's basics about, you know, trust and communication and, um, you know, accountability. Like it's, it's, the, it's, it's basic blocking and tackling. But most people who've been an IC or even a manager of a team, their, their peripheral vision about the, the kinds of problems that come up it, it, when they own all the problems as a CEO, you own every problem, whether it's HR or finance or you name it. Most folks that have been an IC or, or come up through a functional pathway have just never encountered those things. And, and they, can, they can get tripped up by something that might be, if you were a, an HR professional or a finance professional or a marketing professional, you'd be like, oh, I've done this a thousand times. But if, but if you haven't sat in those seats before, you just don't, you don't even know what you're looking at. And, and that's what I think tends to trip people up is, is owning the whole scope of the business as a founder is overwhelming because... 10% of it you can do in your sleep and 90% of it you've never seen before in your life. Um, and you can get swallowed up by the 90%. Thank you. Excellent. Well, it's a, a few minutes after one o'clock and I want to be respectful of Chris's time and everyone else's time. Uh, but thank you everybody that has attended. Thank you very much, Chris. We'd, we'd love to find uh, more opportunities for you here in Spokane. Um, and um, but before we conclude, I, I would want to give a little bit of a plug for our upcoming Sparks Weekend. And, and this is coming up on April 29th through May 1st. And, and this is an opportunity for anybody that, um, one, has an idea that they want to present um, and potentially form a team. Um, and the, the winning team will um, has, is eligible for up to $50,000 in investment capital, assuming they start the company. It's also for anybody that has uh, kind of dreamed about joining a startup or a startup team. Um, if you attend, there's a good chance that you can um, join one of the winning teams and spend the weekend conducting market research, putting together a minimally viable product and, and finalizing the, uh, the final business plan. Or if you're just kind of a connoisseur of Shark Tank, uh, attending uh, startup or attending Sparks Weekend is a, a great way to hear uh, pitches from um, entrepreneurs and also see the final presentation to the panel of judges. And um, the predecessor to Sparks Weekend actually has had a couple of companies that have uh, gone on to Shark Tank. So um, just a great opportunity for all sorts of entrepreneurs in the area and uh, would encourage you to sign up. So with that, thanks, everybody. And uh, Chris, hope to see you in person sometime soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. So long. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jeremy.